приветствую в последний доклад сегодня. Надеюсь, что теперь будет все выдержаться до конца. Доклад буду читать по-английски, но можете в любое время спросить, если я вас понимаю, попробую ответить. Меня зовут Фолькер, я работаю в SAP, в отдел, который разрабатывает SAP JVM. Это Java виртуальная машина, которая базирована на Hotspot, но мы его портировали на другие платформы, на PowerPC, Itanium, SystemZ, PRISC, на другие операционные системы, как AIX, HPOX и так далее. Но сегодня я вам расскажу про Packed Objects, Object Layout и Value Types. Это не зависимо от SAP, это такое обе проекта. Окей, so uh, talk will be in English. Uh, short introduction, uh, what's the difference between value and reference semantics? Uh, in C or C++ we have the choice to use value semantics or reference semantics. So, for example, we can, if we aggregate um, integers in a point class in uh, C++, like here, uh, and we allocate a point, uh, we will allocate just enough memory to hold uh, two integers, right? Same applies for a line, which aggregates two points. If we do something like new line or have a stack object line, we will just allocate memory, which is enough to hold the four integer objects. And again, the same holds true for arrays of lines. In Java, we don't have this choice. So when we have a point class, again, this is just the two inter integer fields in Java, but If we aggregate two points into a line, uh, we will end up with two references, two point um, objects, and uh, this is additional memory overhead, of course. And even worse, with an array of lines, uh, we will have uh, first reference to the line objects, and in the line objects, we will have reference to the point objects. Even worse, in Java, we also have a so-called object header. Uh, this is uh, usually two words. Uh, That means it's a class pointer and uh, another slot for uh, uh, information needed by, for, by the VM for handling garbage collection, locking, and so, so on. So in Java, we have a lot of, of overhead. If we summarize that, we first have the reference overhead, uh, which is just additional memory slots. But we also have a problem with object locality. So as you saw in the previous picture, Uh, the, the various uh, integer slots are not allocated near each other, so they can be spread uh, over the heap. And with modern memory architecture, this uh, can be a big problem uh, when we iterate through an array of lines, for example, that we have to read from uh, different regions of the heap, and this uh, crashes our, our cache. Also, we have the so-called pointer chasing problem. It means in C++, if we do something like this line, we take the first line object of an array and we want to access the x coordinate of the first point. Uh, in C++, that's just one load because uh, C++, the C++ compiler can, uh, at compile time, already um, um, compute the, the offset compared to the array. But in Java, because uh, of this uh, setup, we have to do three loads. First, we have to load the first line out of the array. Then we have to load. Oh, it's not going anymore. Do we have a laser pointer? Ah, no, no, it's no problem. Then we have to dereference the the first point from the line object, and only then we can access the x variable. So uh, what can we do? There are different approaches. Uh, maybe in advance I want to say this, what I will present today that's work in progress, that's still in research, so you won't be able to use that today, and not even with Java 9. I think this is something which will come maybe in Java 10, maybe even later. So don't be disappointed that you cannot use it today evening in your hobby project. So there are different approaches to solve this problem. One, it's called Packed Objects, and it's uh, implemented by IBM in their uh, J9, Java Software Development Kit. It's uh, labeled like Technology Preview, so it's actually not supported, and it's actually not fully Java compatible, as you will see. But IBM has worked on this 
since quite some time. So the first papers appeared like in 2012. They presented it in Java, various Java conferences like Java 1, JVM Language Summit. And what they do, they try to completely remove the reference and the object overhead. And one of their key features is that they also can use their implementation to access off-heap off memory. So all what I've said until now is, is uh, in heap. So in Java, all, all the objects are in the Java heap. But with IBM's approach, you can also um, allocate um, native memory, which is located outside the Java heap. And this can be used, for example, for communication with uh, GPUs or other libraries. Well, so the drawback of the IBM approach is that it's not Java. You will see in a minute why. For example, you can synchronize on packed objects. Equally, and equality and hash code have different semantics. And uh, if you write code that is based on their packed objects implementation, this won't run on a vanilla Java VM. You, but you can still test this. You just have to download the IBM JDK, which is freely available for testing and playing around. And uh, this feature can be enabled with the XX packed objects uh, feature uh, option. So here I have some code which shows how you can use this, uh, this new feature. So first, you have to annotate your class point with a packed annotation. And the class has to be final. And it must extend a packed object base class, which uh, must be imported from the comibm jvm packed package. Everything else stays the same. Now with the line class, which aggregates two points, uh, you again uh, have to annotate it with the packed annotation. And you have, have you also have to declare uh, the, the classes which you want to pack inside the line. So we say import packed point. And then you declare the, the fields, public point P1 and P2. And uh, in the constructor, I have now used a trick here. So this will run with uh, packed objects enabled or not. If packed object is uh, not enabled, then uh, we will have to allocate uh, the memory for the two points. On the other hand, if packed object feature will be enabled, the VM will already take care that when we say new line, the VM will, will make sure that the line will have enough uh, memory to hold the, the two points. So it, they will be embedded into the line object. Again, if you have a constructor which takes two arguments, like the initializing points P1 and P2, if the packed object feature is not enabled, we simply assign them to the local fields. However, if the packed object feature is enabled, we cannot just uh, use uh, the usual Java assignment operator, because actually the fields aren't references into the heap they are already allocated objects. So we have to use the copy from uh, uh, method, which is uh, declared in the packed objects base class from which all the packed object classes are derived. So when we, when we uh, run this, we just uh, allocate two, two points and a line, and we print them out. So we have a point P1, which coordinates 1, 1, point 2, coordinates 2, 2, and the line, which, is, which uh, uh, aggregates these two points. When we now um, assign new values to the first point of the line, and we run without the packed objects feature, then with the usual Java semantics, we will also change the point, because, of course, the, the point field in the line is just a reference to the actual <laughs> point object. So the point and the line both have changed. However, if you run with the packed objects feature enabled, you see that we haven't changed the line. That's the value semantics uh, enabled by the packed objects feature. The same holds true for the other way around. So if we change the point two without uh, the packed objects feature, uh, we also change uh, the point which is uh, aggregated in, in the line because it's just a reference to this point. And uh, we don't touch uh, the line 
uh, without uh, with the packed objects feature enabled. And what happens if we try ourselves to reassign uh, the first point uh, of uh, the line? Well, without the packed objects feature, it's what we expect, what we have in Java. But with the packed objects feature, we will get an exception. This is actually because the with L1P1 is not a, a reference, but it's actually uh, an embedded value. <coughs> so how does this work with uh, arrays? It's a slightly more complicated. <coughs> so we have our line class like in the previous example. And to create an array of lines, we have to declare an uh, inner class called array. It has to be annotated with packed, and it has to import the line. Uh, and again, it extends packed objects. And we must declare a private constructor. And these four functions, which I show here, so the allocate function, which just uh, calls the packed array new array uh, method, which is declared in the base class, uh, in, in the array class. And we say what type uh, the the class we will create uh, should have and, and what, what length. And then, because this is uh, an array class, it's not a native Java array, we have to create uh, accessors. So we create the add methods, which is like the bracket operator in Java, get length, and the clone. It's not so important. So again, this, this, this works uh, as, as you would expect in Java. So we, we create two points, we create a line, and then we say line array allocate three. This will allocate an array of three lines. These are all packed together in memory, like in, in C++. And then we cannot just uh, assign uh, with the bracket operator, like in, in Java, values to the various slots. But instead, we have to use the add, add operator. So we can say line array at zero. And then we say copy from L1. So this will copy the values of the line one into the first array element. And when we print out the array, it will have the expected values. So to summarize, uh, on the left side, we see uh, the Java layout, memory layout of the point line and a line array. On the right side, we see how this optimized version with packed object looks with the IBM J9. So we have the point class which with the object header. We have the line class. Uh, and as I told you, we don't have the references to the embedded object. We also usually don't have the object headers anymore. Uh, they are just created on the fly. So usually when we do JIT compilation and uh, inline all this stuff, Usually, the compiler doesn't need the object headers anymore and, and can eliminate them. But if for some reason we have to pass such an object to, uh, to another method or which uh, doesn't work with packed objects, then we may generate uh, the object headers on the fly. So as I told you before, it's proprietary, IBM J9 only, and it sacrifices Java compatibility. Are there any questions for a packed objects approach? Yeah, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, performance comparison with C++. Uh, how close is it? Uh, I didn't mention performance. I mentioned I, memory layout. So, for um, memory layout uh, and memory consumption, it's it's on par. I would yeah, say. Yeah, sure. And uh, what about performance? Performance. I uh, I haven't done any benchmarks until now, but uh, I will show some machine code that gets generated for accessing the errors later on in the talk, and you will see that it's optimal like, like in C++. Oh, okay, thanks. So the second approach, uh, which I want to introduce, it's called object layout. It's 100% uh, uh, pure Java uh, layout optimized data structure. It's initiated by Jill Teen, which is the CTO of Azul. Maybe you know Azul. They are doing a Java VM themselves. Um, what they want to do is they actually concentrate on, uh, on 
on the on the layout uh, of the object. They are not so keen to completely elim eliminate the, the memory overhead. They, for them, it's important that uh, objects in an array, for example, are, are laid out uh, near each other, or that uh, aggregated objects are right near the object which aggregates them. So again, on the left side, you see the, the Java uh, memory layout. On the right side, uh, there is uh, how this memory can, how this layout can be optimized with the object layout library. So the point class stays the same. For the line class, there currently exists two implementations. One by Azul. <coughs> uh, it's uh, at uh, GitHub. You can look at it. And I've also done some experiments. Uh, what Azul does is they don't, as I, they don't eliminate the, the references. They just they they implement they implemented object layout optimizations in in their GC. So they just if you allocate uh, a line object, they they just allocate the uh, embedded uh, point objects uh, right after the line class. So they always know the offset of uh, of uh, the embedded points. So they still keep these points around, but uh, they don't use them because. When they access the first point of a line, for example, they already know the, 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 the memory location. It's like, like in C++. I've taken a slightly different approach. I eliminated the references as well. So I also uh, get some memory savings. And the structured array of lines uh, well looks like this. So how does this look uh, in Java? So I want to stress again that this library, it's a pure Java library. So uh, you use it, it's implemented all in Java, and you will see, I will try to explain a little bit how this is done. But to, get, to really get uh, to this uh, optimized layout, you need a VM which optimizes this. So this, 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 this is transparently optimized by the VM. But your program will still run on any VM. Maybe slower, maybe with more memory overhead, but it will still run. So the Point class doesn't change compared to a pure Java uh, implementation. Now with the line class, the implementation looks as follows. We have a line class. The embedded fields have to be annotated with the intrinsic annotation, and they have to be private and final. With this trick, we uh, assure that nobody can assign something, a new value to P1, because actually, if we will run in, in an optimized version, P1 won't be a reference anymore. It, it will, will be an embedded value. And we can initialize these values with a library function. It's called intrinsic objects construct within. And it takes the name of the field and it takes the a reference to the embedding object. We can also, we could also call this uh, initialization function from the constructor, but Remember that these are final fields, so we can call it just one time, e either in the, in, the, in the class initializer or in the constructor, but just one time. Um, when we uh, have uh, a, a line constructor which already takes two points, we can simply access, we, we, we still can change the, the value of the points. We only cannot change uh, the reference to them. Actually, there is no reference in the optimized version. So I also have uh, implemented a triangle class which uh, aggregates a line at a point, but that's just for a later example. I won't go into that. And, uh, well, usage of it, it's, it's like before. We, you can create points, you can create lines, uh, and you can set new, new values. Uh, you can, change, you can still change the value of, of the points. You only cannot change the, the point itself. So how is this implemented? So when we call this uh, construct within method, which I introduced before, this will uh, call uh, in, uh, into an abstract uh, intrinsic object model class, which is the base class of all, uh, all this uh, helper methods, and this is the method which can be uh, optimized by, by the VM. If we don't have an optimizing VM, 
the Java implementation will simply use reflection to construct uh, this embedded point object. So we will actually end up with a reference to a constructed point. So as I say, we, will, we won't have a, 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 any win. But on the other hand, when we run in an optimized VM, and I will show you uh, how that looks, then we already, uh, we already uh, uh, allocate enough memory when we allocate the line object. And then we can just construct the point objects inside the line objects. So, but that's, th this must be done intrinsically by the, by the VM. The point is, we don't want to call new uh, in, in our Java bytecode because we cannot optimize that anymore. So that's why we use these factory methods uh, with construct element, and then we can optimize the, the factory methods. <coughs> so this, the error example uh, looks similar to the object, little slip similar to the object layout example. We can, uh, if you want to have an array of points, we just extect, extend the standard structured, structured array class, and we overload the new instance class, which takes the length of the array we want to create. And then we call the structured array new instance helper method. We say what's the, what's the class, what's the resulting array class, so that's our structured array of point class. We say what's the class, what's the type of the of the elements, so actually the structured area of points area uh, is an area of points, and we give him the lengths. And again, we have to declare an accessor. It's called get here, because we cannot use the, the Java bracket operator. And again, uh, creation of such an array, it, it's simple. We just say structured area of point new instance, and then we can iterate over its elements. With the get operator, we get the points, and then we can just set their values. So how is this implemented? I won't go through this. It, I just wrote it down, this call hierarchy, if you want to look at this closer. It's quite complicated, but again, the, the main idea is to use reflection to, uh, to create all these objects. And again, these are the, the methods which would be uh, optimized by an, an optimizing VM to really pack the objects together. If you don't have an optimizing VM, we actually end up with the same memory layout like we would do in Java. Uh, we have here some complicated constructs. Actually, we use thread local storage because we have to propagate the lengths and the constructor arguments and all this stuff from the actual in instantiate method right down to the point where we use reflection. So first, we reflect reflectively uh, create the, the container class itself. And then later on, we have to reflectively create all the, all the, all the contained object of the container. And we have different possibilities with this library. If we don't give them any, uh, if we do it like uh, in this example, like uh, we just say new instance structured array point class, the, the points will be instantiated with the default constructor. But we also have uh, more sophisticated possibilities to provide here, for example, constructors, constructors which should be used to, cons to construct the points. We can also use constructors which take arguments. So later on, when the embedded uh, aggregated objects will be created, they, they're, they're the, by reflection, we will call the constructor with the index at which they will be created, so all this can be done. Okay, so now I will show you, give you an idea how I have tried to optimize this within the VM. Uh, my code is also available at GitHub uh, in, the in my object layout repository, which is a clone of the original object layout uh, uh, repository. What I've actually done is I have changed the class layout algorithm so that uh, when some objects are annotated with intrinsic, I will uh, save enough space in the containing object to hold the embedded objects. I have uh, uh, intrinsified a construct element within method to do the right thing. We will see it. I fixed the interpreter to handle the put fields and get fields on intrinsic fields because actually cannot 
do a put field on intrinsic fields because they are not references anymore. And I fixed the C2JIT JIT compiler uh, so that he can take advantage of the fact that now the objects are packed together. So we can, he can avoid the dead reckoning problem I, I told you about before. So here you see, yeah, please. In order for this to work, don't you have to add some sort of uh, like hierarchical uh, containment mechanism to the GC, actually? Like objects have to be moved wholesale yeah. uh, during collection, yeah, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's true. Actually, I haven't uh, solved the, the whole GC problem. For example, in my implementation currently, if um, at the time where GC happens, you only have pointers to the containing object and everything works fine. Also, when you only have pointers to the embedded objects, everything works fine because they are just moved and survive. The problem is when you have pointers to both the embedded and the containing objects, then uh, as you uh, rightly uh, realized, you need to special, specially handle this. So actually what you would have to do is to, to ignore the pointers to the embedded objects and just move the, the containing object. So you have to you have to tweak the GC as well, of course, to take advantage of this. And in Azul's implementation, they they actually they, they did most of the magic just in the GC. So they just allocate everything together and let the GC do all the stuff. They even they didn't mess with the class layout. That's why they still keep the, their references. And keeping the references has also other uh, advantages. For example, this is a pure Java imp uh, implementation, but uh, if somebody, so, and in, pure, in Java you cannot change the final fields, right? Uh, but uh, maybe most of you know that you actually still can do it if you use unsafe or reflection or stuff like that. So if somebody uses reflection to still set uh, an, um, an optimized intrinsic field, you actually would have to bail out. So you would have to deoptimize all the compiled code which eliminates the dead reckoning and fall back to a normal implementation. And this is easier to do if you have still have the references in place because then you can use them. If you have optimized them out, then you, you have no chance to, to recover from this situation. So it's OK. So actually, what I have done, I, I've actually changed the layout algorithm. So here you, I show you some uh, interesting uh, Java parameters which you can use. They are unfortunately only available in a debug version of a VM, but uh, uh, if you compile your OpenJDK yourself or if you download a, a fast debug version of the weekly JDK builds, you can use these options. And the one option is called print field layout. And if you run your, uh, your program with this option, it will, for, for every class, it will print something similar to this, which say, okay, we have 12 bytes header. That's eight bytes for the. Uh, that, 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 that's eight bytes for the. For the for the class header and four bytes for the, for the for the class, and then we have the instance fields. So it's x and y. They are integer fields. They have they occupy four bytes, and, and that's all. We also have. Uh, there could also be. Uh, Mm, static uh, fields which belong to the class, but we don't have them. And we have some padding here, so but that's not so important here. So the, the main point I want to make is, so if you run without optimizing this, you see that the P1 field uh, in your line class, it occupies four, four bytes. This is a 64-bit VM, but running with compressed oops mode, so a reference takes four bytes. And the P2, again, it takes four bytes. If you run with optimized object layout, you will see that the, the P1 uh, actually occupies uh, 24 bytes. So that's actually the size of the whole class here. You see a point class takes up 24 bytes. So in this case, the, the point class is uh, embedded into the field. So actually both are embedded into the field. So the line class gets bigger. And the same for triangle. So the, we have a line class which takes up like 64 bytes. It's actually the size of, uh, of the line class. 
the line has the embedded points, and so on. I won't go into the details of the implementation, how I uh, uh, <coughs> optimize the construct element within, just so much. Uh, I, the, the, in, in my implementation, construct element within will be handled by the VM like a native method. So you know, if you de uh, declare a method as native, its implementation will be in the VM itself. It will be in, in, not in the VM, in, in, in native code. So what I have actually done is if I if if I load if I load the abstract uh, uh, object model class, I will just tweak the class and say the construct element within is actually a native method in the VM, and I won't even execute the bytecode which which belongs to this method. If you want to look at this, there is there some some example code and some explanations, and if you want to look at the implementation, you can do this and get some more, implement, uh, some more details out of it. So as I saw, told you before, uh, we, we have to uh, change the interpreter. So put field on intrinsic fields, we can just implement as knobs because actually we are not allowed to set final fields anyway, so we don't have to do anything. And, but already for the get field, uh, we have to change the get field the, the usual get field bytecode does one dereference, right? It takes the, it loads the reference, and dereferences is to get the address of the of the actual point object. But uh, if uh, our point is embedded into the line class, we don't do, don't have to do this dereferencing because we know at which offset in the line class it is. So we can just do a, a usual load instruction. So that's uh, that, that that's a win. With C2, I won't go into the details. Uh, so I just show you an example now, as promised. So if you have a, let, let's say we have a shift uh, method, which uh, takes a triangle and uh, translate all the points by a given offset, x, x and y. Uh, so then C2, that's the server JIT compiler, will create the following code for a line like this. We have T, that's a triangle, get line, get point, x, and then increment it by x. So actually, with our pure Java implementation, we will have three loads. First, we will load the line out of the triangle. Then we will load the point out of the line. We have an implicit null check here. So this load will check that our triangle is not zero. And finally, we can uh, increment the x in the point class uh, in one instruction on a risk architectures that there would be another load to load the x and increment it but x86 Intel can just uh, in, uh, increment memory uh, locations so with our implementation we get rid of this debt reckoning and actually this line t get line get point uh, x increment with optimized object layout will uh, will be folded into just one single add long instruction because we know the offset of the x point of the first point in the line is just that offset 44 of, of a triangle. The, the JIT can find that out because he knows the, the points are laid out in the line and the line is laid out in the triangle and they are always in this, at the same position. They are not spread over the heap. Okay, and I wanted to give you a short live demo. So we are running now without optimized object uh, layout and with print field layout. And when we are now searching for the line, you see, we first we initialize first we we initialize the triangle, and it contains a reference to a line, and then we initialize the line class, and as I showed you before, it has just a reference four byte reference to the to the corresponding um, uh, points. Now, if you run with optimized object layout.
Ah, sorry. You see that as, a, as, an, as in the slides, now the, the P1 field is 24 bytes big. There is also one subtle change which you may have noticed. The line class gets now initialized before the triangle class. That's because triangle cannot be initialized before it knows the, the size of the line because it has to embed the line. So these uh, optimizations, they slightly change uh, the way how classes are initialized. This may or may be not a problem, but uh, this is still a point of, for research because uh, Java does something like lazy class loading, so it tries to load classes uh, as uh, late as possible. And if you use such optimizations, you have to load the classes in, 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 such that uh, you always have the, the right dependencies for, for getting the, the size of the embedding objects. You could also get uh, deadlines now. So like in C++ uh, where you cannot have class A uh, aggregates B and B aggregates A. That, that won't work in, in C++. In Java it works because uh, A and B are only references and it's not important to initialize the class before you can create a class with a reference to another class. But if you embed the classes like here with uh, optimized object layout, uh, you will get uh, uh, recursive class initialization error exception. And that's actually, uh, you, you don't even have to program that. It, it, it comes, uh, that it's a natural error you will get from, from these optimizations when you try to do something like that. Okay, and uh, just uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, let's look for the shift function so this is the this is the machine code for the shift function and you see we have all these these loads here which i showed you already before you we we, we load uh, the lines from the triangle and the points from the lines and we have all kind of null checks and uh, you see here we have like uh, four null checks at the end of the method and uh, when we do the same with optimized object layout, you, you see uh, th this is the whole method now. So we increment all the, the integer fields, the six integer fields with just one instruction and we have just a single now check which is the one for the triangle so that could still be zero but uh, all, all the embedded uh, fields they are known that they cannot be zero because they are part of triangle so we don't need these null checks anymore okay so long for the um, object layout do you have questions regarding the object layout okay there may be I will come to the last approach. It's called value types or value objects. It's uh, the proposal by John Rose, Brian Gertz, and Guy Steele. So this is actually the, the most complete and uh, most complex uh, approach. But unfortunately, it's in a very early stage. So there is unfortunately no code at all to play with. So while the IBM approach is available for testing, and while the value object uh, library is there for as Java only and with some optimizations this value types uh, uh, approach is still in a very early stage so it's just a, just a discussion stage there's a, a, a position paper by John Rose, Brian Gertz and Guy Steele where they explain what they want to do so <coughs> they really want to introduce value types which can be used for everything not just for for fields, not just for aggregating objects, but you can also use them for variables, for function arguments, as return types of functions. So that, that's really like value types in, in, in C++. And of course, that's not so easy. You saw the difficulties we had with these small libraries, which only try to optimize the layout. But such huge changes, they really require changes of the virtual machine and also of the Java language specification. And that's why these changes probably are for sure not in Java 9 and maybe won't even make it into Java 
10. Maybe you remember how long it took with generics until they were uh, finally discussed, or even with lambdas, took a long time to get it right. And this is a real, a, a real, really bigger change. So there is still some time to come. But still interesting. You can see that this is uh, early discussion change because there is another JEP, 169 value objects, which sounds like does the same thing, but it is already defunct. It's not, not uh, used anymore. It was a very early proposal, like two or three years ago, but now we have this, uh, only this proposal. So in the last five minutes, I just want to give you an idea what uh, the people, what, what John Rose and Guy Steele, what, what they intend to do. So this is like, uh, they, they, they stress in their paper that uh, the, the syntax, you, sh you shouldn't uh, complain about the syntax, it's just, just for discussion. So they just uh, have a new modifier by value, and then you define your class point, and this means that points would be value objects. And uh, once, if you, if you compile such a class, then you, you, you will get new bytecode, so v new, v put field, v return, these are all new bytecodes with the leading v. Uh, and also you may realize that a usual class has uh, something like this, the constructor is just called init in brackets. And the constructor of a, of a point class, of a value class will be called new, just to distinguish it from a real constructor because it actually does something quite different. So if you have, in, in usual Java, if you have a point, point class and you say point P equals new point, what you actually do is you call, you have a new bytecode, new point. The new bytecode will just allocate memory on the heap, which is large enough to hold a point, and returns a reference to this point. Then you duplicate this reference, so you end up with two references on the stack. You push the arguments on the stack, and then you invoke the constructor and the constructor will just probably assign the, the arguments to the containing fields, and uh, then it will store the, the, rema the, the remaining reference to the local variable P, so in this case it's a six slot. So the, the constructor of a value class will actually only in, in initialize class which is on, on the stack. It's, it's just a value. So you also won't call new on a value type. You would say something like point P equals make value. Then we'll just push the two arguments onto the stack and you will invoke this constructor of the value class. And actually this value class will then call itself V new, which just allocates a space on the, on the stack and allocates the fields on the stack. And then you will just uh, store with vstore this stack object to the point. That's, that's actually what happens in, in C++ as well if you have an automatic variable. Uh, it will just allocate uh, space in the, in, the act in the current stack frame. So um, what about uh, Arrays, I will just take the array example on the, on the right side. So if you create an, an array of points, which are value types, we still do a new point, so the array will still be allocated in the heap. But now the array won't contain 100 references to points which may be spread all over the heap, but instead it will already have enough place to hold all the points embedded, one near each other. And these points, they, they won't have an object header as well. I forgot to say that in the previous example. So value classes, they don't have an object header by, by, by default. So uh, this is the new v new array uh, bytecode. As I told you, it allocates enough space to hold the 100 points, not references to points. And then when we want to assign the third point in the array, we actually just call make value again and this will, uh, after pushing the, the, the arguments on the stack, it will call the, the constructor of the value object, which will construct the value object on the stack, and then it will copy it into the array. So the, 
icons tree, that's the array index, it's the first on the stack, and then we pull the arguments, we initialize the point on the stack, and then we store the, the stack value into the, into the array. So as you see, there is a lot, still a lot to do. This is all not implemented in the VM, um, and, nor, uh, and by far no, uh, there is no, no agreement on the, on the actual syntax and how, how this will all work out. But if you're interested in it, this is uh, all, all discussed in the project Valhalla. And uh, if you go to the OpenJDK project, you can follow the mailing list and the discussions, sometimes quite interesting. There are also some other projects going, which are currently going on uh, in the OpenJDK. One is called Project Panama. Its main intention is to, con to, to do something like uh, JNI 2.0, so uh, enhanced uh, access to native methods from within Java. But one of its subtopics is also better access to native data. So it's somehow related to the, to the way how the IBM Pact objects approach uh, handles off heap data. This is something which may be implemented in Java in, in Project Panama. And there are also other papers which I listed here. There's also the RS 2.0 uh, proposal by John Rose. And uh, yeah, I, I've just put together some links and uh, some mailing list threads. If you're interested in this topic, uh, you can read them. So that's actually all. I think the time is over. But uh, if you still have some questions, it's the last talk. I would be happy to answer them. I also will be here all evening uh, and tomorrow as well. So please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. So thank you. So are there questions right now? Or everybody wants to go to the whiskey party? <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, from what I actually understand, the, all these things related to memory allocation, uh, um, the main idea is to reduce memory. Uh, that uh, need Memory footprint, right? Foot footprint, yes. Yeah. So we usually, uh, in any program, uh, we use uh, lots of arrays. And uh, uh, take into account that uh, you're trying to allocate whole array as a single sequence of byte, uh, will it uh, cause fragmentation of memory and which lead to uh, loss of uh, memory itself and uh, getting uh, Java heap bigger? You mean uh, if you allocate all the objects together, you will have big chunks and that will lead yes. to fragmentation? Yes. Will it? E well, yes, it will, but uh, I, I think the, the problem is not that you get allocation. I mean, you could do your heap slightly bigger because memory is not so expensive today. The bigger problem is with memory locality. So mm -hmm. it's better if you, have, if, if you need to use a slightly larger heap, but you can work your ob objects linearly and not have to jump all, all, all over the, the heap. So yeah, it may be that Depending on your garbage collector, it may be harder for the garbage collector to, to pack all these big arrays or this, this, the, the objects will get bigger. That's, that, that's true, yes. But I don't think that it will be so, so much of a problem. Maybe after one whiskey you can ask another question. Yeah. <laughs>